believe that our hearts have been um, caused for love and thanksgiving for all that God has done through us, for us through Jesus Christ. And I hope and pray that your heart has been drawn to God in worship and in affection uh, this morning. Well, before I get into my message, I just wanted to take this opportunity to mention a couple of uh, information, announcements, or something like that. First of all, we do have planned some Nerf games on New Year's Eve from 7 to 9 out in the Family Center. We're going to be monitoring the situation, uh, but we still those plans are still in effect. And if anything were to kind of go south, we would... Um, let you guys know about it as quickly as possible, but we're still planning on Nerf, Nerf games as of now. And then also, we're coming down to the end of the year, and during this time, we get many questions about year-end giving. So in, in order to just inform everyone, uh, in order for giving to count for this tax year, it needs to come in before the end of the year. So you can uh, give online, you can give today. Or you can drop off an, a check at the office this week, and we'll make sure all of that is taken care of and accounted for the end of the year. And people ask about, you know, special opportunities, if they want to give a significant year-end gift. And I do have two that I want to mention briefly, and if, you're, if it interests you, you're certainly welcome to ask. We can give more information. One of them is uh, outside of our church family, one of our missionary partners, our global ministry partners. And this uh, family works in a limited access country, so I'm not going to give a lot of information. But I do know that they're planning to purchase a car for their second term. And they've spent their entire first term without a vehicle. But now that is a, a growing family, and it's just a growing need. And so in most places in the world, vehicles are more expensive than they are here. So it represents a very significant purchase uh, for them. So if you would like to give to a vehicle fund for one of our mission, uh, ministry partners in a limited access country, that's certainly worthy of your giving dollars. And then also here at, at Lake Hills, we're planning, and we haven't said a lot about this yet, but we will be soon, we're planning to do some remodeling this year, uh, probably going to start with the fellowship hall downstairs. And if you know anything about construction, it's all very expensive. So if you would like to give a designated gift, kind of a year-end gift, toward the Fellowship Hall remodel, then you can just mark it that way as well. So those are a couple of opportunities, and we'd be glad to give more information if you would like. Well, uh, we've, uh, today we're going to unwrap our last and final gift of Christmas. We've talked about the four gifts of Christmas, and... Um, and we've, we've mentioned, we've unwrapped each one at a time, and they're actually not physical gifts, so my sermon is not in this bag, okay, just so you know. They are not, the best things in life are not things, they're not material things. And the four gifts of Christmas that we're talking about, you might be familiar with them more in some of the songs we sing. They are peace, hope, love, and joy. And we've looked at three of these already. We looked at peace, that it's not just the absence of war, it is something better in its place. It is a renewed wholeness. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. And so through following Jesus, he guides us on a path to growth and wholeness and even restoration of the broken areas of our life. So peace, shalom, is a is a place of wholeness and completeness in our lives that's restored to us through the grace of Jesus Christ. And then we talked about hope. And again, hope is not what you think, necessarily. It's not wishful thinking. Hope is a, the confident expectation of good in your life. And, um, and it's, it, hope is uh, summed up, I think, for the child of God in Jeremiah 29, where it says, God is speaking to his children. Now, of course, in Jeremiah, he was speaking to the children of Israel. But in the New Testament, uh, the followers of Jesus are God's children. And he tells us, for I know the plans, the future plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And so when we know that and we 
And, you know, the Bible even tells us what that future looks like in a lot of ways. You know, we can read the last chapter and know what those plans and future look like. And when we know that deep within our heart, it gives us confidence and security in the present difficulties that we may be facing. So it's a promise in the future that gives me strength in the present. And then we talked about last week, we talked about love. And the Old Testament word for love, and these are kind of word studies that we've been doing, looking at how these words are used throughout the Bible. Love is the affection and the care that you give to another person. And it has this idea of loyalty mixed in with it as well. It's not necessarily because the person deserves it, or um, they can give you something in return, but it's, it's, it's more unconditional than that. And really, the verse that summarizes this for you and I is, uh, you and me, is Romans 5, 8, where it says, But God demonstrated his love, his affection, and his care for you and I. He demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, undeserving of that love, right? Unworthy of that love. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he came and he gave us the, the greatest care, the most important care that we all needed, which was forgiveness and salvation. And so then, um, you know, we can um, add, and I just want to add a little bit to that love idea, because sometimes when you talk about caring for others and, and uh, giving care to others who don't deserve it, you know, I think it's important that we can clarify that there are, we still establish healthy boundaries in our life. Love doesn't mean you just go on caring for someone irregardless of how they are treating you badly and poorly. You know, I think the, the classic example of this is a, a parent that has to protect their own children in an abusive situation. So you have to create boundaries for your own uh, well-being. The Lord Jesus Christ died on a cross for unworthy sinners, but that's not an expectation, okay, that he puts on you in your own home and in your own family that somehow you have to die and allow yourself to be hurt and injured by this person. No, I, I think there's a sense of safety and well-being that God has and wants us to have for ourselves as well. So anyway, now, we're going to look at one more present. Now, I, I want to do a little survey here. I wonder how many of us, you know, you save a present till after Christmas. Does anyone do that? You might want to go home today and just look under the tree one more time. There might have been one lost, you know, way back in the back corner. There's still a present under that tree, and today is December 26th. Does anyone save presents? Anyone? Not even one? You don't like to spread out the fun, Right? No, okay, I don't know. I always was, kind of, you know, in, in Costa Rica, they, they celebrate, they didn't really have Santa Claus. They had like the three kings. And, and there was like, there's different cultures where they get presents and they're kind of scattered out. And they're still getting visits with presents into January. And I always thought, that's really good. You know, you could just have it all year long, right? Well, we still have one more present to unwrap, even though it's the day after Christmas. And that is... Um, the last gift that we're going to look at is the gift of joy. And, and to do that, I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bible. We're going to look at this word and how it was used in the Bible. And, um, and again, we're going to look at a few different passages. So you might have to look, find a passage and hold your finger there. You might want to jot some of these down because I'm going to mention verses that we won't actually look at as well. So we're going to start in Psalm 65. And, and if you're using the Black Pew Bible that we provide there in the book rack, in that Bible, all you have to do is turn to page, I think it's 661, is going to bring you to Psalm 65. And of course, we always encourage you to look along with us in uh, God's Word. And you can do that at home. Get your Bible out. Get your phone out. Psalm 65, Jeremiah 33, and then Proverbs 23. Okay, so if you're Looking in the Pew Bible, that's uh, page 661 is Psalm 65. And then I think it's page 913 is going to be Jeremiah 33. And I'll repeat these later on as we go along. 
Now, joy is a key theme throughout the Bible. You know, we, we sang about joy today. If you notice some of our lyrics, and of course, the quintessential Christmas song, Joy to the World. So this is a gift of Christmas. So, but how does that come together? How does that play out? What is joyful about Christmas? And, and I think this idea of joy and happiness and, and delight and cheerfulness, this is something that, that we all look for in life. And every language has these words in, um, in their language. And ancient Hebrew has like four different words for, it might be translated joy in your Bible, or delight, or gladness. And it's all through the Psalms and other places. And then again, in the New Testament, again, there's like four different words that are translated in your Bible, uh, joy or rejoicing, and those kinds of ideas. So this is a common idea. And, and it's something that we're all familiar with, that we all long for, and we actually all seek in one way or another. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at two things here. We're going to notice the, the kinds of things that bring joy that we see in the Word of God. And then we're going to look at uh, how this, the, the joy of a child of God, how this theme runs through all of Scripture. Because basically... Um, when we talk about joy, and I want to kind of um, lay out kind of a, a definition here, if I can find it in my notes. Joy is the attitude that God's people adopt, not because of happy circumstances, but because of their hope in God's love and in God's promise. See, this is the difference of the Christian joy. When we talk about Christian joy, and I think... You may be familiar with this concept. It is something much deeper than happiness. The word happiness comes from the English word happiness, comes from our, the, the old English word happenstance or circumstance. So when things happen to me that are favorable, that, that uh, are positive, then I'm happy. So the, the whole idea of, of a simple happiness is very dependent on happenstance or my circumstances. Joy, on the other hand, is something that is much deeper. So joy is something that we'll see Paul talks about that you can experience when things are not all going the way you would like them to go. Because it is something that is inner and deeper and more substantial and stronger than just simple circumstances. And that's what I want us to see here today. And we're going to, um, as we think about uh, the Bible and we look at these sources of joy, in the very beginning in Genesis 1, God said that he looked at everything that he had created and he said it was all good. He actually said it was all very good. So there's a, all of this goodness that is in the world that brings joy to God and to people's lives. You know, there's one verse in Proverbs, and we're not going to turn to Proverbs 27, 9, but you can jot it down if you want. And it even says that perfume and ointment bring rejoicing to the heart just as a man's friends or a person's friends bring to them. So there in one verse, he mentions two sources of just human common joy that we can all experience. One of them is fragrance. You know, you, you get, you know, where does that idea even come from of aromatherapy? Hello, it's in the Bible. You know, they use all kinds of ointments and perfumes in the Bible. And, and there is like this, you know, there's a pleasure, there's an enjoyment, right? And of course, the idea of friendship is, is in a much greater way, is a great source of human joy, uh, having a good friend and the Bible acknowledges this and tells us about this. So there's, there's this idea of there's, there are these uh, sources of joy just in life, in this good world that God has created. And we read about, kind of capsulize some of that in Psalm 65. So let's read Psalm 65, and beginning in verse 9, and we'll read down through verse 13. And what I want you to look at here is just the general goodness of God in the world that every human being can experience on one level or another and experience joy. Notice what it says here, beginning in verse 9. You visit, speaking of God, the psalmist is just talking about his joy in life. And he says, beginning in verse 9, God, you visit the earth and water it. 
you greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the earth with the, the year. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. So these beautiful poetic pictures of this uh, agrarian culture where there is this abundance of harvest and uh, the crops are going well and there's rain and, and this is all God's blessing, right? So we have a plenty and we're joyful. Yeah, you think about that, and you know, over this past year, I don't know what kind of year you had, or but if you look back over the course of your life, I hope that you can see the goodness of God and the blessing of God. And we live in such a, a blessed society in America, and you know, there's a lot of criticism of our culture and our society today, and and you know, a lot of that uh, is generational, you know. Back in the 60s, all of the college students were like down on culture and society and the status quo. And here we are again, and it's a lot of college students are down on uh, uh, capitalism and, and our culture and our, our way of life and all of those things. But you know, when those young people begin to grow up and they have to get a job and they have to provide for a family and, and they find out that in our society and culture, there is a land of opportunity here. And most people, you know, some countries put walls around their country to keep people from getting out. You think of China. You think about the people in Hong Kong and Taiwan right now. They're very limited. You know, Taiwan is like on the edge of, are we going to be, get sucked into this uh, government state? In America... We have to build walls to keep people from getting in. Everybody wants to come here because it is a land of opportunity. It's a land very much like the psalmist described here in Psalm 65. And do you know what? We experience a life with a large degree of joy. If you just talk about material blessings. Now, I know, you know we're all exposed to sickness and, and, and difficulties in life and sadness, and we're going to talk about some of that. But I'm just talking about on the surface level of the goodness of God in this beautiful world that he created, there are all kinds of sources of joy. And so we can be, it sounds like a Thanksgiving sermon, doesn't it, instead of a Christmas sermon. But we're going to get to the other half. And, and, and so there is this general, uh, some people call it common grace, this idea that uh, God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. There are blessings that abound. And, and, and you may not enjoy all of those kinds of blessings, but you, I'm certainly, I'm confident you enjoy many of those kinds of blessings that bring joy to our life. We're experiencing it right now over the holidays when you can spend quality time with people that you love and enjoy their company. And we're spending time with the other one that I'm about to mention right now, okay? That's in... Um, um, well, let's go on to Jeremiah 33, and then I'll get to this last one that I was just thinking of in Proverbs. So let, we're going to look in Jeremiah, and here uh, God mentions the joy, the common joy of a wedding. And, and again, he, this prophet is using this, this common joy that we all experience. Let, we'll read it in verses 11 and 12 here in Jeremiah 33. He says, The voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of those who will say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. So here the, the prophet is talking about this... Uh, He's talking about, he's using a, an illustration, right? You know, preachers use illustrations all the time, right? So he's using a common source of joy that people in that day and people in our day, I mean, everybody knows you go to a wedding and, and you're going to have, you know, you're going to be touched in your heart, see these two people in love that are committing their lives to each other. And then you're going to be this, you know, joy-filled celebration at a reception. And this probably... And, and that's just you as, a, as, a, as an invitee, right? As a, attending the wedding. 
but the people in the wedding, the voice of the bride and the voice of the bridegroom, right? They're the ones who are like overflowing with joy, right? One of the greatest joys, the common joys of this life is the joy of a wedding and marriage and uh, when that love is young and tender and it's full of joy, right? When you get old like me, it's all bitter and you're like, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. My wife's watching online. I'm in trouble now. No, you, you get my point. And, and, um, and Jeremiah the prophet is using this to talk about a greater joy. He said, he said, that joy that we all experience, that's probably my wife calling in right now, saying, what were you saying up there? <laughs> There's a much greater joy, which is God and his goodness and his prosperity and his blessings. That is like magnified a hundred times greater, that joy. Now, there's um, one other one, and that's in Proverbs uh, 23, if you want to turn there. And that's going to be on page 752 in the Black uh, Pew Bible there. And um, we're going to look at this one. And here it says, um, here it's talking about the joy of children. The joy of having children, of raising a family. And notice what it says here in Proverbs 23, beginning in verse 24. We're going to read 24 and 5. It says, The father of a righteous son has great joy. He who has a wise son delights in him. May your father and your mother be glad. And that's the idea of joy. It's just a synonym. May she who gave you birth rejoice. And so here is this other common joy, which is the joy of a family, again, right? But it's, the, it's more specific. It's this idea of children. And let me, can I just pause here and just say that in our culture and in our society today, it's like there is this, I mean, maybe, maybe not, you know, in your close circles, but I'm talking about in the broader culture, exists, you know, and I don't know how this idea, like, you know, children are a bother, you know, and, and it's just like this, oh, there's such an interruption to my life and my freedom. And, and this, this kind of information is just like pumped into young women, too. You know, that you don't need to think about a family. You just need to think about a career. You just need to think about yourself. And, and, and there's some balance in that, you know. I mean, if you want to go to college, if you want to spend a few years working and doing different things before you settle down, whether you're male or female, there's nothing wrong with that. And there's probably some good things about that. However, let me just say, one of the greatest human joys in life is family. And, and, um, and being able to raise a family. Listen, I remember, I'll just give you an example. In my own, my own family, my sister, my sister was, uh, you know, she was very academic-minded, very intelligent. She went to college, and you know, this big CPA degree and job, and, and she got married, and, you know, like, just time just kept clicking by, you know, like eight years. They were married for eight years before they had their first child. And she was just kind of that upwardly mobile mindset. I think I've shared this before years ago. But anyway, um, and so I was visiting her after... Uh, they had their, their little boy, Cameron, when he was, he was, you know, just a few months old. And I was down there visiting with her. And, I, and we were walking into Publix grocery store one day. And I said to her, I said, Sarah, Terry, and I, I was single. I wasn't even married at that point. And I said, Terry, so tell me, what, what has been the most meaningful part about having a child now? And, um, and she, it didn't take her long. You know, she kind of thought and looked, and she said, well, it's two things. She said, number one, it's a whole lot more joy than I ever imagined before. And it's a whole lot more work than I ever knew. <laughs> and every parent in this room could say, amen, <laughs> right? And she went on to have, uh, you know, she lost a set of twins. She went on to have two more girls. And, you know, and I think if you were to nail her down right now, I mean, you know, she went on to do the homeschool thing, the whole nine yards, right? 
And now, as an empty nester, you know, she's working full time. But if you were to nail her down, I think she would be quick to say, oh yeah, I would have had my kids sooner. Because you can do a lot of great things in life and do them. Do them. But I don't think you will find, man or woman, I don't think you'll find many joys greater than the joy of raising a family. Now, that's not for everybody, and I know that. But I think for most people, <laughs> that's going to be your experience. And, 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 and there's no harm in that. Don't be ashamed of that. Because that's, that's really, you know, when you see that couple, I mean, we've got some folks here today, they have their little children, and they're visiting grandma and grandpa, and you're just together. My friend, it doesn't get much better than that. It really doesn't. And, and let's not take that for granted. And, and, and God is saying, he's using those as illustrations of, of the greater joy of knowing him. These are, these, all of these joys, the joy of a prosperous life, the joy of your wedding day, the joy of the birth of your first child, all of these are, it's like when you want to go to a Christmas party or you go to some place um, and they have appetizers, they have hors d'oeuvres, right? Is that a French word? I don't know. And, you know, they have little snacks, right? But there's this big meal that's coming, right? You know, and you know how they call it appetizer? It's because it's supposed to open your appetite. It just, like, gets you ready for the main course, right? Well, the joy of family, the joy of a successful career, the joy of all of those joys, the joy of living in this beautiful world and visiting Yosemite or the Gulf Coast or the Smoky Mountains, the joy of going on a wonderful vacation with your family, whatever your, the joy of your career, whatever your joy is, my friend, that, all that is is a tiny little appetizer for something so much greater, so much, and, and it's out there. It's like what's next. Right? This is just the appetizer, but coming very soon is this main course. And the psalmist said, in God's presence is fullness of joy. You love sports. And that's, that's, a common, that's a gift of God's grace, that you have a healthy body, and there is fun to be had, and there's competitions to be fought, and all of those things. But you know what? When you're enjoying whatever it is you enjoy, just be, remember this. That's a gift of God. And, and he gave it to you just to let you know that he has something for you up ahead that is that and 10 million times more. It points us to a greater joy. You know, and um, on that Christmas night, The angels appeared to shepherds. And shepherds in that day, they had, you know, they had become, you know, the, the Israeli people were always shepherding people, right? And Abraham had his flocks. But in, in that first century Israel time, the shepherds had become a very low class. They were considered uneducated and dirty. They, they spent most of their time outside in the elements in the fields, caring for animals. And those were the people that Jesus, the, the angels appeared to. And, he sa and, they, and the angel said, Behold, I bring you glad tidings. Glad, which is like a synonym of joy. I bring you good news of great joy. Right? And sometimes, uh, and, and, and it was the birth of a Savior, the one who would come. And, and create that door, that opportunity for endless joy because he would come and be born in the most difficult and humble of circumstances. But then he would go on and to die a sinner's death on behalf of those shepherds, on behalf of you and me in our place to take our sin so that we could be forgiven and we could be made a child of God, which would open the door for eternal, everlasting, full, and complete joy. 
That's what awaits us now because of what Jesus did back then. I don't think those shepherds understood exactly how those dots all connected when they saw that little baby. I don't think they saw a cross. But you look at that wooden trough and you look toward a wooden cross where Jesus would die and and resurrect and secure your salvation, your eternity, your eternal joy. And um, we read earlier in Philippians 3, and and I want to be done. We read earlier in Philippians 2 where it says that he will be exalted and given a name above every other name. He will be exalted to the highest glory. Do you know what it says in the Bible? It says that you and I, as his children, as his co-heirs, that you and I will rule and reign with him. We will participate in that glory. And, And my friend, have you ever won a championship? Yeah, I, I won a, I won a few championships. I was actually just on the team, okay? <laughs> I didn't really, I had a few good plays, but uh, not a lot of them. But we won some championships. And I don't, that's one of the, that's that joy. That's really something, you know? You won. You fought. You, you worked hard. You gave it your all. And you won. That is a joy when you win in life, right? Whatever it is. My friend, we win. We win the greatest of them all. We will rule and reign with Christ. And knowing that, I can celebrate now. It brings me joy now, today. Let's bow together for prayer. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I wonder if there's someone here with us today or perhaps watching online and perhaps there's a tugging at your conscience that this is what you need this savior this one who was born so humbly treated so horribly but rules today victoriously as the risen savior well my friend he can be your savior you can invite him into your life just through a simple prayer of faith Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I don't deserve your heaven. But I believe in Jesus Christ and I believe that he died for my sins and that he rose again. And right now I accept him into my life as my savior and my God and my king. Would you whisper that prayer in faith right now? Well, my friend, at Christmas time, you can receive the greatest gift of all. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Would you invite him into your life? Would you just pray, dear God, please give me the gift of eternal life. I know I don't deserve it, but I receive it from Jesus Christ, my Savior. Would you do that right now? And I wonder how many others of us. uh, These messages have touched my heart, and I hope they've touched your heart, that there are intangible things, not physical things, but spiritual things that we can cherish and we can enjoy and we can take heart in. Peace, hope, love, and joy. They're gifts that will remain with you throughout this year and in the days ahead. Oh, Father God, we pray that you would teach us that even in the dark days, That our joy is in you. And you promise never to leave us nor forsake us. That we can choose joy even in the midst of difficult things. Bless us and help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing one final song. Would you stand with me? We're going to close with an old Christmas hymn.